Pacific Grace presents Tracing Summaries 2021 The ineffable words of God that over edify us and lead us towards the great transformation. So faith has different manifestations and it's necessary, it is necessary to be tried in what we say. When you confess something, be it ministerial or personal, and you become that idea that God is putting in your mind, so then after you confess it, then criticism comes. They begin to judge you, and then suddenly you are attacked. Even your own brothers misunderstand you. The, your family, your brothers, oh, that you're wrong, that you exaggerated here. But that's good because you judge yourself and you say, what I'm doing, is it true? Or, But God allows for all of that to take place. And when you confess the word, whatever you confess, that is the word, not just anything. When you confess the word, that carries an audience in the heavenly places. That has an audience. The angels listen. That is why when it speaks about the angels, they say that the angels listen to the petitions. So then those angels, according to your experience, they say he's confessing that, but it doesn't suit him now. If I give it to him now, he loses. When should we should respond? Let's take measure on what he is confessing. And suddenly you're going through a stage where you feel nothing. You don't see anything. You don't feel not even a breeze. <laughs> And there and there, the mind begins to think and to think, to exercise your mind. And all of us have gone through that kind of fire. I've, uh, for many years, well, I've had wonderful moments, but there, there comes times where I see nothing, where I feel nothing where you begin to ask yourself, I've, I've failed in something, is something wrong, this? And they have been the best moments for my life because that's where the sensors exercise and it strengthens the spiritual stakes in your life. So then... After you are tested, when other trials come, then you are calm and the others say, wait a minute, no one moves this individual. It's that you have gone through trials. That's why they come exactly that when situations come into your life, you will be strengthened. There is an enemy of faith that that one, it's very evil. Your eyes, what you see. What you see modifies your mood, your eyes. That is why Paul said there, let's look for it, second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 17. Look at what it says. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's working for us a far more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Sometimes it is a problem for you to see. Sometimes you see too much, and what you see doesn't help you for anything. Because what you see changes your feelings. What is written doesn't change, but what you see, 
And if you're not mature in faith, what you see is affecting you. What you see modifies your feelings. And suddenly, what you believe by what you see modifies your confession. It changes your confession. In changing your confession, the angels see that one day you're saying one thing and the following another and the following another. And one day you were reigning in life and blessed and now by what you see, the circumstances change your confession. Sometimes those things are what weakens what you have confessed and seen and it's written and have believed, suddenly that you confess begins to. It begins to fall by what you see because your eyes change your feeling. What enters your sight changes the feeling of what's written. And that is why faith is tested. It was not accompanied by faith. They heard the word. Listen, there are people that are listening here tonight. But there are others that what they hear, they accompany with faith. I receive that this is going to be well. But there are others that say, mm, and they begin. I call those the laboratory minds. <laughs> they are walking laboratories. Right there in chapter 6, verse 12, what does it say? That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Faith and patience. Patience to wait. Well, let's finish with Romans chapter 4, verse 19. This verse always draws my attention of our forefather, Abraham. In those days, he was the father of faith. In chapter 4, verse 19, it says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb and did not doubt or waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. When you consider your body weakens, it's your confession. Faith. Say faith. Two letters. F-E. Faith. So short and so much that it encompasses. Therefore, I declare that your confession stands, that you confess with me that all is well, that what you believe last year, now you believe it better, with more glory, with more certainty. Matthew speaks of the word of the sower. So does Mark, but Luke studied it diligently. Let's read in chapter 8, verse 4. It says, And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke 
by a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up with it and choked it. But others fell on good soil, sprung up, and yield a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this. The seed. Well, before finishing here, let me tell you, all of us here are going to be placed in those three terrains. In one way or another, you're going to say, I am there. There's no escape because this is a parable that today we can interpret because of Paul. The disciples asked, and he explained, but they didn't understand, because before Paul appeared, no one understood. We've been given the gospel of uncircumcision, so we have the privilege, the honor, of being able to interpret correctly what we're going to read now. It says, Verse 13. And those upon the rock are those who receive the word with joy when they hear. And these have no root, who believe for a time and in time of testing. Say testing. What is a test? A test is what you go through, what happens to another that you see, and what you hear from others. It becomes a test for you. So then when that trial comes, if you are not sustained, you are one of those that understood. But when the test comes, you are not prepared for that. We are spirits that are complete, cleansed, perfect, without blemish, without wrinkle. But what quality of a vehicle was brought to you? If it's a vehicle with stone or a vehicle with, with thorns. Now here, there are no vehicles along the way. Those are the ones from the system. Those are the ones of the way. That's what they call the apostles. These are the ones of the way. That's where they are, where they don't understand. But here, there are terrains that are good ground, thorns, and stones. And you defend yourself however you can, because I'm not going to help you. <laughs> there, you cannot be helped. There is who you are, and who you are, no one can change. I... If someone comes to me and says, Apostle, look, this man that is there, I don't like. Who interprets? He does, not me. Well, if you say you don't like him, well, you don't like him. A week later, he says, Apostle, this man that is there, I like. Who interprets? He does. Well, you say you like him. Tremendous. The following week, he says, Apostle, I am the evil one, not him. So then you say, well, then if you're the evil one, be calm. We're all evil, even I. It is to say, here you are not here to help anyone. You can't help anyone. Everyone must carry his own load. You can have a son that's an excellent believer and one that is worse. You perhaps can suggest, but you can't change if he's a stone or a thorn. 
because he has a belly different to the other belly. There are bellies that are dead and bellies that are alive. Here, you can't help anyone. In this ministry, not even prayer. Don't ask because we're not going to pray. Because we can harm you. And advice less because we can give you a bad advice. Imagine that you are a stone and I give you an advice of a thorn. How does it say? Verse 14. The, those that hear, it says, but the worries, riches, and pleasures... And listen, riches are not bad, nor the pleasures, but if they don't allow you to bear fruit, they're bad. These are the ones that don't sow because their belly doesn't allow them. Don't you see that? They see that as an expense. They don't accomplish anything because they love money. So when you love money, you have to machinate, you have to lie, you have to, to be doing a series of machinations. Don't you see you love it? So if you love money, the riches and the pleasures, and you get involved with pleasures, you don't congregate, you don't hear the word of God, it doesn't allow you to concentrate, everything entertains you. You know that in the Bible, there were two women that Jesus went to visit, and one was called Martha and the other one Mary. So then Martha, there's no one that can change Martha. The preachers out there, they preach of this so that Martha can be married. But when she saw Jesus, her thing was that the plates be sh shined up to give a good impression with the cup she was going to serve. That isn't bad, but in the old covenant, but not when the word arrived. When she saw Jesus, she became oh, so engaged in cleaning everything up. So Mary said, it's not time for that. Forget about that. No, it's that the bed hasn't been made. And what if he goes to the bathroom? Well, forget about that. Sit down. I can't, I can't allow Martha. Come on, sit down. The master is here and he is speaking. But those folks are entertained with other things. Those people with a spirit like Martha, they entertain themselves with what needs to be prepared, what someone that's going to visit is going to eat, the kids. This, when they're in the church, they entertain themselves with whatever. Or they look at someone else and they begin talking with someone as the preacher is teaching. Because anything, don't you see that there are spirits like that that don't have an ear? And they're with us, but they don't have an ear. The problem is that when Jesus says, listen, pay attention, Lazarus is going to be resurrected. But Mary heard, when? This evening? And Martha said, no, I know he's going to resurrect in the latter days. I'm not talking about the latter days, Martha. I'm speaking about now. But it's that she don't listen. So those are measures that are among us. And as much as you demand of them, it's a problem. So then if you get involved with those folks, you wind up fighting with them and you become engaged into problems because you're trying to change a Martha and a Mary. They don't hear right. And the ones that are stones, they hear and understand. Look, blessed, reigning in life, everything is well. From here to heaven, but their eyes deceive them and their ears because they hear. But suddenly they hear that a brother utilized, utilized the card, everything is permissible in that ministry. And he's in the ministry. And what happened? Well, that there were problems. And notice that they hear, understand, but they can't hear bad news from a blessed one. Because immediately the legalism they have, they say, oh, well, I'm not returning to that ministry. I am not congregating. What? That who? So-and-so? What happened? Really? But that wasn't the bishop from, or the pastor, or wasn't that the one we had confidence in? Confidence in? And what happened? 
That is a trial. When that news, everything was good. They were tithe, they were sold, they walked, they were moved forward, grace here, there. They would spread the word with cassettes, sold for the radio, but they gave him a news, a test. And it says it there. They hear and understand. But at the time of the test, there they don't have no material. Now those that fall in good soil and bear fruit a hundredfold, those are people that a hurricane can pass by them and they say, what happened? <laughs> That's the, his problem. <laughs> Those can be told whatever. Look, they don't, they don't see. They don't hear. They are like the monkeys. Yes, those are folks that it's that they're already made that way. Have you seen folks like that? That they're so. It's that you know that whatever may happen, they're always firm. Doesn't matter what goes. They can be told. They can be told this that they say the lord that's his problem that's her problem something might have happened i don't understand listen there is a saying that says from the indians that say don't judge your neighbor until you walk three miles in his shoes once you walk three miles walking there then you'll say this dude is because don't you see that all the blessed have different vessels of clay? If there is clay, why do you think that Paul said, from on now we know no one according to the flesh? Because you will go adrift from the covenant in seconds. Retaining our confession or our profession or our convictions because that is what the gospel of uncircumcision is. Something one professes, something one confesses. Let's begin. Well, let's read first Colossians chapter 1 verse 26 through, through 28. It says like this. It says the mystery, not the ministry, it, we are speaking of the mystery which had been hidden. That is what growing in grace was given. That is the grace that growing in grace was given. The mystery that was hidden from ages and generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. And you may say, well, that was 2,000 years ago. Why does Paul say now? But to Paul, it was given to write it, not to explain it. But he placed it in 14 epistles, but it continued totally hidden. It says, to whom God would make known what is the richest of the glory of this same mystery among the Jews. No, it reads among the Gentiles, a mystery that was hidden among the Gentiles. The Jews were hardened. And we will read later about that, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach warning every man, woman, child, and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. When it says for the Gentiles, we the Gentiles, the uh, chosen, the great, uh, graceful ones, here we feel for the Jews because this mystery wasn't for you. We love you and God loves you and we're going to see what the word of God says about you. But this specifically was for the Gentiles. That is why the calling of Paul, Paul having been Hebrew or Roman, whatever he was, Paul was chosen for us, the Gentiles. That's why he put everything aside as garbage. He says, the garbage, I'll set it here. I'm going where God is with the Gentiles. Maintain that in mind that that mystery was hidden for us, the Gentiles, and we should take advantage of that because the system, what they do is eat Judaism. 
when the mystery that was hidden was for us, the Gentiles. You don't have to be eating Judaism. The teachings of the 11 apostles were Judaism, and their teachings are what the Protestants and the Catholics and all of these so-called Christians base their doctrines on because they're not Christians, they're Judaizers. But the mystery that was given and was hidden was for us, the Gentile. If you are Gentile, well, eat from the table. Eat what you're supposed to eat, not foods that wasn't destined for you. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, when it says Christ in you, sometimes you may think is that Christ comes within you. But let's see, before thinking like that, let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 19. To see how Christ in us, what does that mean when Paul says Christ in you? Christ in you, the hope of glory. It says, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. For Christ to be formed in our lives, we have to hear the mysteries that were given to us, the Gentiles, because that is a knowledge. Uh, you serve Christ with the mind, and in your mind, you begin to receive, I am perfect with one offering. I'm free from the devil. I am free from sin. I have a clean conscience. I've been chosen from before the foundation of the world. So that begins to form a character, a glory, forming a confession in you. And in that way, Christ is formed. That's why Paul suffered with Galatia, because he begun there. But when the apostles arrived, the enemies of the gospel of, the, of Christ, they obstructed the growth in that church. Because the works, the, the fasting, those things the Protestants practice, instead of forming Christ in you, they remove Christ from you. Romans 9.11. Romans 9.11. For the children not yet being born. Hello, listen closely, church. Blessed that are listening through internet that are sacrificing yourself to be saved, and you don't know that you come saved from the womb. They had not yet been born, nor having done good nor evil. There are no works there, good or evil, that the purpose of your free will. No, the purpose of God according to free will. No, election may stand, not of works, but of him who calls. Blessed. I don't know with whom I am speaking with, but before you were born, before you were what you are, a, a drug addict, an alcoholic, whatever you've been, that doesn't determine your destiny. Your destiny is determined if God has chosen you before you were formed in your mother's womb. You are perfect in Christ Jesus. There is a way of thinking. It says, brethren, do not be children in the, or in understanding. However, in malice, be children. But in understanding, be mature. You know that if you are mature, and you think correctly, you're not malicious. You know that being malicious is something that's unpleasant. You know those people that think they know it all, that say, oh, this man is not going to fool me. No, I. And they walk in malice. Now, if you, if you have your way of thinking in the measure of faith you have, then you don't have to walk in malice. You don't have to walk defending yourself if they're fooling you, if they're deceiving you, if they do or not do. No. One of the things that, for an example, in my personal case, I have many learning centers and or bishops all around the world. And sometimes one may want to, like, to control them all. A full control. However, you must trust. 
You have to trust that that bishop is faithful, that everyone is faithful. An apostle, what if they're deceiving you? It's not a problem. Here, no one fools anyone. You're fooling yourself. People that are malicious, they're always harming themselves. It says here that you should be as a child in malice, but mature in your way of thinking. And that keeps you rejuvenated at peace. Sometimes there are people that ask me, how can you manage so many people and so many situations that arise? Simply, I don't manage them. I am mature in my way of thinking, and the one that guides us is God. I'm not the one that's carrying this load. Not Jose Luis. I look that uh, I don't get involved, but that the Spirit is the one involved. In the like manner, if you are walking in God's rest, you are going to rest in a marvelous way because of your way of thinking. Say, my way of thinking counts because everything is in the mind. With the mind and your way of thinking, you will overcome many obstacles in your life. And you will rest, you will be at peace with your way of thinking. It's how you walk in the promises of this covenant. But you have to have a way of thinking, and it should be a mature mindset, not childish. Because the apostle sees that Maturity nullifies malice. Malice is all of the opposite of living by faith. Because if you live by faith, nothing concerns you. What's for me, no one can take away. Malice is to think evilly. Malice produces competitiveness. Malice produces malice. Because you can't be at peace and you're not confiding in your angels. For you, the angels don't exist. Because your malice is what replaces the angelic coverage. But if you live at peace and you have no doubt, so then that gives you rest. You don't walk in malice because your way of thinking nullifies those works of the flesh in you. The people who are malicious are unpleasant. A person that has malice is tremendous because you do something. They say, oh, he did it because of me. You say some, oh, he's saying it because of me. No. Don't you see he is always in the defensive side? He don't live by faith. He has no faith and he sees everyone is against him. Anything that's said, oh, he's saying it because of me, because he lives in malice. He's not in faith. If you are in faith, you lay down. Let them say whatever. Let whatever happens, happens. You remember Robert? The one they call Living Stone? Robert used to say, I don't defend myself. He who has the truth does not defend himself. I'm a father. I don't know. There are certain... Uh, there's a certain peace you should have with those that associate with you. They should be attitudes in you where you don't, if you're not too quick in making, taking action. Oh, that to be in malice that if he tells you this, uh, make sure he don't, you know, let me know. No, rest. Let them hurt you if it's possible. You've never been deceived. They've deceived me many times and it's done me well. What is the idea, the competitiveness? Oh, no one takes me as a fool. No, because I. No, be at peace. Rest. Take a little suffering. Relax. Relax. Let them fool you. Let them pass over you a little. It suits you.
let and leave a place for the wrath of God because when God defends you, hello, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Our way of thinking. You have to be mature in your way of thinking. Be childlike in malice, but mature in your way of thinking. And how is one mature in their way of thinking? Well, applying the covenant with what you've learned. I'm going to demonstrate maturity here. I'm not going to defend myself nor say a word. Tranquilo, Bobby. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen. The angels are with me. I'm not going to move. I'm going to take it easy. Angels, have your own way. Have your way. Take your place. Do as you wish in my life. Here I give you the opportunity to do as you wish in my life. If you truly work here, you have a good candidate. Work with this angel that's here in an earthen vessel. Do that and speak it audibly so you can see the changes that are going to come to your life. There are changes that are noted. It says the things which you learn and receive and heard and saw in me, these do, and the peace of God will be with you. No, it isn't the same, the peace, than the God of peace. <laughs> Say, I have a measure. It can be gold, it can be silver, or it can be precious stone. It can be 30, 60, or 100 fold. The measure you are, take these tips and apply them. It will come to you as gold. It will do good. Rest, be at peace. Apostle is that they failed me many times. It doesn't matter. It's that this has happened to me. I've experienced this. doesn't matter. God called you, not the one you have by your side nor the other. It is you he called and he demands this fidelity. It says, a heart born of purity and a clean conscience that when somebody speaks to you, doesn't see wavering. That they can cease that you're sincere. It doesn't matter what they see in you, but that they see that you are sincere because the angels will be with you at all times serving you. And that measure that was the one that God gave you, that measure will inherit all the promises that God has given you.